This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to John Harland and uh, Thomas Gaidasik. Uh, my name is Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. We're discussing uh, my recent video, Sheffer Polynomials, Combinatorial Space for Quantum Physics. This is our second discussion, hopefully not as tame as the first one. We'll start by um, simply asking John and then Thomas to bring up the questions or comments you have, and I'll pull up the slides. So um, I guess my questions are just a clarification on the bijection between um, the partitions of a set and the pedigrees of the um, of the polynomial terms, um, the terms in the polynomial. And you then, see the screen, right? That's yeah. Right. So, so you know, just to go back over that, and just to make sure I uh, understand where all those terms are coming from, but um, that can be done quite quickly because I think I, sure. I studied okay, it. So this is the most complicated screen. Do you see Right, it? right. And actually this screen was quite nice because it, it really showed you the constructive version of the of the bijection as opposed to the... Mm -hmm. the and I hope I have this all correct. But the idea is basically the no. same. So, yeah. And it just so, shows like it would be possible uh, to... Uh, and this was a learning experience for me. But basically like it would be possible to write out a notation where you could see how the term and the derivative is constructed, right? So right, the right. notation yeah. I use is that, well, um, you're taking, at each stage, you're taking a derivative of something. So let's say, you know, you take first the derivative of the A of T, and then you, at the second stage, you also take the derivative of that term and then factor, and then you also take the, so that'd be number one, number two, number three. But for example, over here, uh, maybe, First, you're um, doing uh, differentiating. Oh, yeah. So first, you may be differentiating the E of T, and then that would give you this guy. And then you may differentiate, and then this would give you another child term. So the crucial thing, and then, then you may differentiate this A of T. Yeah, yeah. So, right. of course, this notation can be very confusing because this doesn't mean like the second derivative. It means the first derivative, but at the second stage, you're taking the first derivative. Of right, right. That's right. That's right. So whereas yeah. here, you're taking two derivatives. Right, so right. when you did it at the yeah. first stage and the second stage, and then you did E of T, you, you on the third stage, you differentiate that. So that's... And the, and the critical thing here is that differentiation works exactly that way, is that you hit one term at a time when you differentiate. And by the product rule, yes. By the product rule. Yeah, that's what the product rule is telling us. So I, I think, yeah, I think that... This slide I liked a lot because when you do induction, of course, induction it has a certain magic to it, right? There's an mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's the space case and then the in, induction step, and then the induction step almost seems like you're cheating, you know, like you you've already got mm -hmm. the structure set up, and then and then you're just sort of adding to that structure. Where this constructive approach tells you exactly what you would get if you if you went through the process to the third level it turns into a mess but at least it's an intelligible mess and it's it's not even that messy i mean it's very intelligible it's, it's it, it but the problem is is that if i had to um it's very challenging uh, from a writing point of view because if i had yes. to explain this i'd have to spend a whole hour and i would have to create all kinds of ideas and terms and notations you know i'd have to verbalize everything right so i'd have to come up with a name for what are these uh you know um yes. what do they call them? hashtag right, right. one yeah, that, and hashtag... Yeah. i mean it would just go on you could spend days well, and then, you know creating and then, notation for this and then the notation <laughs> oh, the just... notation would be as unintelligible or, or or at some point you know as much cognitive overload as trying to understand the induction so it's uh, you know, right. it's so, you, have so to, I think, you have to, you know, induction is probably the only way to to really truly write down a, a compact proof. Um, well, this is still would require induction. This doesn't, um, how do I say, this doesn't eliminate induction. It just makes the induction constructive, as I was yeah. saying, or okay. at least that's like, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, you still use the idea that, okay, we'll look at the nth step and then we'll get to the n plus first step, right? Okay. So um, you get that. So all that would carry over the same. You'd still be using mathematical induction. But the difference is, is that, um, how can I say? I was, uh, see, when we do it with this way, constructively, we're showing the bijection. The bijection is being manifested constructively. 
But I got the same bijection non-constructively, you see, like without going through all this construction. I just said, look, like at if the if this is true at stage n, this will be true at stage n plus one, you see, like because in the step from n to n plus one, you know, I have very limited possibilities and the, the possibilities would honor this, etc. I'm just not gonna write out all these possibilities. I'm not gonna create a language for writing out all these possibilities, you see. And so I'm not gonna be constructive because I just don't have the, because no one would pay attention to a constructive. Well, no, but language. I think one example like this says it all. You know, like I think that it's- Yeah, but and, so and that's- I'm glad, you, I'm glad you did this because it, you know, I mean, there's a lot going on here and, you know, it's nice to see an example where everything is just written out, you know, in, in detail. Like, you know, to me, that's the way you understand that anything abstract right. is you look at a good example and then and then you you kind of believe I, in I sometimes think of that like as the Babylonian method like because like in the old cuneiform plates like they would have basically a great example you know but no proof or no anything they just pick like the best right. the most illustrative example would be how they would encapsulate the knowledge yeah yeah for the and, you know, theorem it, or whatever it turns it out that luckily it's when you do that you're right maybe about 83 percent of the time or something you know um so but just oh, just i just want to add a personal note like this was very great uh, for me like one of the rewards of taking all this time to write everything on all these slides etc was there were several rewards like that where i got an insight uh like about that well like that distinction between constructive and non-constructive that uh it's it's not just a philosophical question but it's a very practical question like so um, you could do all of your maybe a lot of lot of math constructively, but it would defeat the purpose of the mathematics. You know, the purpose of the mathematics is to make it more succinct. So not to uh, have all that mental verbiage that I would have to have, you know, to talk about like, well, how do you describe, you know, what's going on here, right? All of a sudden, everything has an order, right? The order, you know, the order, you have to, so uh, not to have like, so and it kind of is a little bit comparable, like to later on, I talk about that, um, the, the covering spaces and how they, you know, you get these um, loops or or you get these um, mm -hmm. um, degeneracies or you get these, you know, ambiguities or whatever, like you get these collapses. Right. So it's similar here, like, yeah, you can spell everything out, but that's not helpful. Like you want to collapse notation. In yeah. Some way. And I thought that was a really interesting connection that, you know, I mean, that's something we should discuss a little bit more because I mean, that, that has real possibilities in terms of, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, well, just, you know, as a theory of combinatorics, right. I, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. a, I don't know if that exists in combinatorics, but it seems like a, a really yeah, analogous just, idea to, uh, algebraic topology you know so it just seems it just seems like it could be fruitful anyway i like this this is, when i hit this slide it was like oh oh good you know, like I, I, I felt like well that you know this the clouds opened up and I, I i could see everything in detail and then i it was kind of obvious like it, it made the mm -hmm. bijection mm -hmm. rather obvious the other the other thing is your particular notation for partitions i think you mentioned it earlier that you know this idea of free space you know mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's your own kind of creation but you can think of it as a partition with zero in it right i mean you could create right. a compartment and just throw everything into the zero anything that's with zero yeah anything that's with zero is the free sp space mm -hmm. what you call the free space part but you you decided to uh use different notation where you don't use you you don't you, you don't use zero there explicitly with a zero compartment <coughs> and you just have a free space compartment but there's a it's just another way of labeling these partitions right it's, and it's so, exactly and so maybe i can ask thomas uh what uh, mm -hmm. you know well he had a related comment or perspective so yes maybe... i mean what my comment is that for the logic it seems for me easier to grasp what is connected when i keep the zero mm -hmm. i know it's there, but I know that I want to partition. And if it, if there's a zero, okay, I call it a vacuum, but I could call a different state vacuum too. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if singling out the number zero is really helpful. <clears throat> I mean, it, it hides a symmetry that the same 
result would be obtained if I call the number two vacuum. It's possible. Oh, uh, in terms of number two, right. So first of all, I mean, there's the semantic choice, right? Like, yes. so, I mean, it could have been the number seven, right? I mean, like, a, you know, we could use letters. It doesn't have to be numbers, you know, so and it goes on and on. Uh, yes. I think I played off of the, so again, you know, notation, mathematical notation is a matter, it's an art form at this point, yes. you know, it's a matter of choice. So I tried to use the idea that in we have this, um, these conventions in math where sometimes we count starting with one, but sometimes we count starting with zero. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of use both conventions here um, by saying like, well, uh, I think a zero will be the initial, but one will be the first. Cause I didn't want to call one the second, you know, and so on. So I had to, you know, I had to come up with something like that. Uh, so that's, that's just a little shrewdness yeah. perhaps. Um, but the question is, why do that? You know, like like you say, like uh, uh, people have not been doing this. Um, I'm not clear, like how this whole result, how original it is. I mean, in a certain sense, it's not original. But on the other hand, like, why has it not been more um, brought to attention? That's maybe too trivial. I don't know. But the point being that, um, yeah, it's the simplest is just to say this is encoding uh, sets of, uh, I mean, partitions of sets. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's in combinatorics, uh, if you look at um, partitions of sets where you have, let's say, K parts, uh, those are uh, sterling numbers of the second kind. And so uh, if you add up the sterling numbers of the second kind, you'll get the bell numbers for whatever N that you're interested in. So it shows that there's a lot of combinatorics that could be more specialized here in terms of you know how what you're what you're counting, what parts and which things. But the way I'm doing it, okay, so why would I do it this way? And what might be the physical con uh, you know consequences? The reason I'm doing it this way is because of the way I proved it. You know, I proved it as uh, through this derivative method, right? Mm -hmm. So when I take the derivatives, uh, well, the first thing to notice is that this a of t, is distinct from the e to the x u of t, mm -hmm. right? So it says that the x is, so combinatorially we say, well, the x is a weight that's being carried by the parts, but the only parts that get the weight are the, it's not the, it's not the initial part, you know, in this, in this scheme. So there's a distinct, there's a distinguished part that does not get this weight x. And all of these other parts, they're originating from taking the derivative of the e to the x u of t. But you had one part that has a different origin, right? So if just looking from this formula, it, there seems a lot of reason to want to uh, have, um, you know, to note the distinct origin, to note the distinct character. Uh, if we're only looking at the number of terms, then, you know, we're ignoring things like the x and we're ignoring the difference between a of t and u of t. But... Um, so when we look at the differentiation, we get the three cases. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so the three cases, I think they're right. Let's see, calculating the derivative. They're going to be right here. So yeah, you could talk about these three cases in some kind of way where you don't uh, talk about the initial part as being different. But that would be, I don't think that'd make it simpler. I think it'd make it more complicated. Um, where are we here? So, and then another place where this comes up is, oh, maybe I have to be the bijection, yeah. Here, okay, so I have, okay, in the second case. So here I have these, where am I? Okay, here I have the three cases, right? Mm. So the point being that when I take the derivative of the a to the a uh, j prime of t, it's different than taking the derivative of the x u of t. Well, that these are all three different cases, and yeah. that would not come out if I didn't have a distinguished part. It would just be hard to. Does that seem important? Well, yeah, or... yeah. Or you could say the distinguished part is the part that has contains zero, right? I mean, you could say that, you know. But but uh, I mean, you 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 have to make a distinction one way or another. How if you're labeling it with as you do as a as, as a adding to free space mm -hmm. or if you add to the zero compartment the, the compartment containing zero it's isomorphic right it's just it's it's a matter of what language you want to use i mean to me i kind of like the way you do it because 
it makes a bit of a distinction. It makes uh, more of a distinction between right. uh, the pedigrees that come from differentiating A, which are very simple, right? They're 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 easy to trace, and the pedigrees that come from the other terms, which are more difficult to trace. Those those result in some right. Collapse, they're very right? different. Yeah, they collapse, and, and... right? They 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 add. You know, when you add them together, they they kind of do this kind of uh, you know they have non-trivial uh, combinations so, where. Um, Thomas, do you have a comment on this, or? I mean, you if you write your... J as L with index zero, then you see the symmetry again. Okay, so like, let's say you have, uh, yeah. So let's say we put L with zero, right? And then if we took the I mean, derivative, okay, so it'd be derivative of instead of x u to the L of zero, it'd just be u to the L of zero. Derivative of u to the L of zero, add new element to the zeroth compartment, right? Yes. And you wouldn't have to call it free space, yes. right? right? It's like, right. but yeah, I mean, for me, I don't care if it's called A or X or U. I mean, the, the behavior is that you have a derivative and you have a derivative either of A or of U. I mean, you don't have a U which it doesn't, which has no derivative. You don't get it. It's never there. It's always right. Different. That's another thing is that it's very interesting is that the, when you take the derivative of E of E to the X U of T, the u always the baby u always comes down with a derivative, right? It's very interesting. Yeah, you know it's interesting if you're into, if you're into this, but it's interesting. Yeah. Whereas the aft does not, like the father is not start off with a derivative, right? So that's kind of there's that distinction. But you don't, but you don't have an element of the father if you don't have a derivative there, right? So in that sense, it behaves like the zeroth order of u in some way. So and, like that's another point, like AFT, that can be an empty compartment, so to speak. Yes. Except that um except that in this, I mean, from this point of view, it makes logical to think it could be an empty compartment, except from the see, okay. So maybe the difference is that um the difference then is that um that compartment actually has an element, it has the zero element that we're ignoring. So it's not symmetric in that sense, right? Like, so if it was X, I mean, if it was U, um, you know, in L to the L zero, right? But L zero, and if, if like L zero L1 could equal zero, L, right? L three, it's still a number. Right, but L zero can equal zero, but L one cannot equal L1 zero. L one can be equal to zero too. Then you don't make the derivative. Right, but then you don't right. have it, right? Yes. Then it's then equal to one, it. right? But then it's not equal to. They have different weights. I think that's the other thing. Like you know, so uh, this weight is coming from a of t, whereas like all the other compartments have the same. Um, you know, they have the same u of t meaning. I mean, I understand for u of t meaning, but I'm going for the symmetry. If you allow that any of your L uh, one, two, three, and so on could be zero, then you have to say that the weight of there is zero. You don't have an X coming with it. Right, I think, I mean, I can appreciate what you want to do. I'm just maybe trying to, just to show like why that, if I did that, you know, you could want to do that, but if I did that, it just wouldn't be, um, reflection of what the math is trying to say i think you know because um what the yep. math is saying is saying like well like first of all a of t and u of t are different functions now if u of t and a of t were the same function right then th then who could argue with you i think like that would be the issue right well and then the, the other argument would be like well if it wasn't um if a of t was the integral of u of t That'd probably be better, right? Like, so let's say the A of T was the integral of U of T. But for the Hamid polynomials, I think you even have that. No, I'm that sorry. Let's see. Thing generating part in the part before your exponent and in the exponent. Say that again. Uh, I think when you have the example of the Hamid polynomials mm -hmm. in the beginning, right. you even have the same function for A and U. That may be, let's see, um, why, don't we, why don't we look at that? Yeah, I mean, you have it here. It's, 
on the computer here at home i think i didn't download it okay so it's here uh it's basically oh. i think it's the next when you have i mean at some point you give it explicitly how right. it looks Maybe like it's towards the end right <laughs> maybe it's towards no the... i think it was in the beginning okay maybe you're right you're probably right okay here right so it's e to the negative one half t squared is a oh, yeah. of t mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh no, like, yeah, not, sorry not u of t not is like just there, t but hermit. but hermit you have one over one minus t and then you need a t so you have also one over one minus t is which one are you looking at the like the hermit the or the yeah the like ones oh well, this is a t over one minus t. So, and this yeah. is a one over one minus t. But yes, yeah, so the only let's look at the Hermit. You see, I think one, one of the issues is is that um, if you see when you take the derivative of uh, e to the x u of t, you pull down a derivative of x u of t, which is x u prime of t, right? So, if oh, okay, so if you wanted to make a of t comparable, you'd want it to be the integral of u of t but so that, that when you know that, that never works out because in the exponent it should be a logarithm and then you get it as a basis well not so not, not not the logarithm but like when you take this down um this will be um x times t prime so this is a this is a double hmm So I didn't mean Hermit, but I, when I was thinking, I was thinking of Laguerre, where you have this similar function of as a fraction that appears as the front factor and as the exponential factor. Hmm. Well, what's the derivative of uh, t to the one minus over one minus t? Well, it's, it's got a term that looks like one minus t, but then it's got another term, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So it's t over one minus t, and then there's a, one negative one over one minus t squared let's yeah. see or maybe it's a positive right. one right because it's a positive one right yeah so it's, it's not quite yeah it's not quite the derivative um, so it's t plus one oh so it's t times one anyways <laughs> i'm not gonna try again. hmm but if you look at the derivatives i mean the mm -hmm. derivatives of your series that you have are exactly the same because the derivative of one goes away and the rest of the function is identical. Which 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 series? Uh... Just look at the Laguerre and the series that you write down for Laguerre. Right. The first series of A of T and the series of U of T. Oh, they have the same derivative, you're saying. They right. have exactly the same derivative. Hmm. In some way, for me, they look like the same function. And that you have a constant in the beginning is just that it wouldn't make sense to have a generating functional, which for the variable zero doesn't give anything, which makes it zero. So, well, and then maybe, um, okay, so that is an interesting thing about Laguerre. Laguerre, in my speculations, you know, it has to do with the bound states. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in the middle of the interac interaction. Uh, so, um, that might kind of be related to this fact possibly somehow that you know you have this extra symmetry um in that sense that's interesting yeah that is interesting like for the hydrogen atom so for example uh in, in terms of the radial i think component mm. um but that, that um, one's a constant plus the other yeah that's that's interesting so u of t is a constant plus a of t a different by a constant mean, the point is that he uses in all his parts he uses a prime so a derivative of a and a derivative of u and they are identical now another uh, argument uh, for that distinguished well, that is, component that is, that is very yeah that is an interesting uh, well that that says laguerre is kind of distinguished in some way um mm -hmm. I, I don't understand the physical connection there but um so it says that those 
terms from those different pedigrees will combine. Um, again, I don't I don't know what that. So well, it just so, says that they're they they have a comparability, you know. So it's so, basically kind of like what Thomas is saying that you know in so Thomas, you're, you're like, you know in some kind of constructive combinatorial sense they're basically very similar, analogous. They're up so, down but, down there, but like if you look at the Hermite polynomials, uh, if you take the you know you have e to the negative one half t squared, you have e to the x t. So if you take the derivative of um, this mm -hmm. one up above, you know you get negative t, right? Mm -hmm. Well, negative t and x t, they're very similar, but they're similar up on top, mm -hmm. right? So it's another place where they're analogous. It's in a different zone, you know, of comp mm -hmm. comparison. And see, this is the type of thing um, when, uh, you know, we had our, uh, you taught me some linear regression, and then I'm interested in the generalized uh, linear model. And the idea is that you're getting five different ways of um, making the comparisons. And so you can kind of see in these two examples, like how different zones would be relevant for making comparisons between maybe like the AFT and the UFT, for example. And that the idea is that there's five ways to, to make that comparison, uh, maybe. But maybe that's what it's about. Like, how do you compare the distinguished compartment with the other compartments? Where, where does a comparison need to take place for them to be comparable? So and maybe this your, your argument is that if you put it, if you put a zero there, it, it emphasizes kind of the symmetry. Yes, um, it, it, it's uh, only it, that. It, for me, including the zero makes it more symmetric and to some extent easier to, for me to deal with it and saying, okay, they're similar, of course, in every series. I have a first element which is usually indexed zero. I mean, why not? But and so, otherwise, so, that's fine. So where this is unfolding for me is that, uh, and that's why this discussion is so helpful, you know, mm -hmm. um, is that um, in my mind, like how it's developing is that it's helping to explain, well, you have, you know, I'm looking for these five cases of how things can be set up. And it's saying, well, the way Thomas thinks about things, there's one case where that will really resonate. You know, mm -hmm. that's what be the Ligier case and the bound case, something like that. Maybe there's more cases where like, but the, but the idea is that somebody else will want a different uh, way to think about it and they will have a different case that resonates with how they think about it. And there's basically five ways to think about it. So to give another argument, um, mm -hmm. why to distinguish that compartment, um, a polynomial, like so S sub n of X and you, you'll get this n factorial, but it's going to have um, n plus one terms. So yes. not just n terms, but there's, uh, you know, because x to the n and then x to the one, but then there's x to the zero. So that makes for n plus one terms. And so when you do the x to the one and then you do the x to the zero, yeah, you can say it's more symmetric to say that x to the zero is, a you know, a constant is like x to the zero mm -hmm. with a coefficient. But the point for me is that... Uh, that is like a degenerate way to look at a power of X in very much the way where I was talking about like choosing one out of one is different than choosing one out of several, right? So yeah, you can do that, but it's like saying, well, like counting the subspaces of a vector space, and then you switch over to counting subsets of a set. Well, a set in the vector space, that just kind of seem different, you know? And so there is some kind of way to think of it as a limiting case. But but that it, but there's a way of appreciating that that's kind of this degenerate and for a good reason. So and especially in in all the things I've been doing in math uh, with the divisions of everything and such, this notion of choice seems to be super central. Like that that's the way to kind of think about things. That each there's more and more ways, different ways you could think about choice. Um, and so it, it's interesting that choice comes up here. So. But does this argument about the polynomial impress you, Thomas, or not? You can <laughs> you can put it like that, but it doesn't really impress me. I mean, I know that the <laughs> polynomial of degree n has n plus one terms. That's it. Okay. It cannot Another, be different. What about you, John? I don't know if you're. Well, I I <laughs> I, I, I I like what um, Thomas brought up that that um, there is a case where 
there's going to be a folding of terms, a, a combining of terms from the what you call the free space mm -hmm. uh, component or the free space compartment and and the other ones. Um, and th that seems to be very interesting. I mean, there's a certain like you were trying to talk about uh, uh, combinatorial covering spaces. There there is a mm -hmm. situation where uh, there's not so much of a distinction between those different kinds of partitions and uh so in a sense doing a more symmetric notation might emphasize that on the other hand you're pointing out that that only happens in limited cases but at least those limited cases are to me i didn't realize that there was this distinguished case for the for the i guess laguerre uh where mm -hmm. where maybe those distinctions between what you call free space and and the other compartments is rather artificial you know so i i don't i i don't know um I, I don't know i think this again we're talking about notation but uh so maybe in the end you know in terms of mathematical isomorphism it doesn't really matter right what well, so I'll talk about like what but why it matters and how it relates to physics you know we're like where physical intuition starts creeping um well, it matters uh you know like so for example in the Laguerre case, if it's dealing with the bound states, right? Well, if you are in a bound state, then free space basically may be a compartment. You know, like, you know, if you're in a bound state, you know, and you had an arisal of a wave function, you're going to have a collapse of wave function, you're somewhere in the middle. Well, all of a sudden, maybe your free space compartment isn't so free anymore, you know, and it's acting like a compartment. So there really isn't any distinction to be made. But if you look mathematically, like in the broader case, not that particular case, but it's very fascinating, and I still uh, haven't chased down the end of the, the tail of the tiger, but um, why this five-fold classification? Because in the one sense, when you look at it, um, there's the Meixner polynomials are the most general. Like you get uh, two roots, alpha and beta, and they're kind of like a particle clock. It's kind of like having two frameworks in space. And you can take steps alpha going one way and you can take steps beta going the other way. Now, this thing specializes. So you can, in the way it specializes, well, alpha and beta could be complex. Okay, so that's a strange specialization in the first place because you have basically alpha and beta are supposed to be real and comparable, but you can let beta equal uh, alpha bar. You see, and so in the sense, it's a specialization, but in a sense, it's, you know, you've left the real numbers. So that's one specialization. Another specialization, you can let alpha, uh, you can let beta equal alpha. That's the Laguerre case, where it's like steps going forward, steps going back are the same, have the same units, alpha, alpha. You can have uh, alpha equals zero and beta equals zero. So that's like the Laguerre space case, but where the steps are zero. So the two physical frames have been basically smashed together. They're identified. That's what happens with the collapse of the wave function, you know, and that's the typical quantum harmonic oscillator that the Hermite polynomials model. And that's the physics we know. Uh, but then um, at the arisal of the wave function, you can have uh, beta equals zero, but alpha not. So it's kind of like maybe collapsed in one direction, but not in the other direction. So that's when you kind of like enter the bound state. Um, that's the arise of the wave function. It's kind of like maybe like has related to do with the propagation of a particle. But where is this happening mathematically? Because it's strange. You know, why would you have this system of classification that's coming out like this? Well, there's something particular where like when you divide through by certain things. So for example, in the why is you know yes the Mike's Napolitic case is the most general in a certain sense but you see if you have a term where it's like one over alpha minus beta you get this like unit step that kind of like going forward going backward it could be multiples of alpha minus beta but you see if alpha equals beta you can't have that step and so the thing kind of crashes you see and so then that spits out a special case where like alpha you know beta so similar like if you had a one over alpha type of term but if alpha equals zero, you're in trouble, you see. So there's some kind of things like where you're forced to consider special cases um, when you um, when you do these things. And so that whole like pentafurcation or, you know, bifurcation, whatever, the way it kind of crystallizes out is what I'm trying to chase down. Um, does that make any sense? 
Well, a little bit. I, I mean, I think you need a, you know, you've shown me this before, this, uh, these particle clocks and so forth. And I think you need to create another lecture or, or yeah. you know, video, video on that connection. I mean, like you've made, I think this video that you've made already on this makes, makes it very clear this this bijection, but the actual interpretation of it needs to now be fleshed out in a, in another, another you know, I, I mean, I, I, we we've been talking about this for quite some time and i'm still i'm still uh you know it's, it's still a model luckily now <laughs> this is no longer a model i understand where these terms are coming from is is quite fascinating yeah. um but i i think that you need to flush that out you know i i that that's like i i can't comment on it because i don't quite understand what you're talking about it does it does um remind me of something called the spontaneous collapse theory in quantum uh -huh. Um, so maybe this is a detailed sort of a toy model for this spontaneous collapse um, that that some people like to talk about. Um, we, could maybe, we could maybe talk a little bit. I think I know a little bit about that. Maybe I'll say one more thing about this particular graph, and then I'm curious what Thomas has been thinking. Uh, but just to say, like, here's one more reason why that um, uh, free space, uh, that, as I call it, could be different, is that um, when you have the constant term, um, well, it looks like this, right? Uh, the Hermit polynomial. And so these Hermit polynomials are being multiplied by, let's say, um, they're what I call space time wrappers. So it would be like e to the negative one half x squared or something like that, you know. And so, uh, but what this is saying, you know, is that, uh, okay, so the Hermit polynomials will change where you are uh, in terms of how many times you cross. So you may, the, the line is, so the constant isn't crossing, uh, it never goes negative, let's say, or never changes um, positivity or negativity. Then with a line, you would change once. And then with the, um, I don't know if this, parab this parabola may be off, maybe it should be raised, but uh, it should go probably, no, it's going no, under no. and up. Yeah, it the parabola cuts it twice, that's right. This cubic cuts it three times, then the quartic cuts it four times. So you get these uh, cuts into the space. Yeah. And so um, what it's so the point being that when you have more compartments, um, when you have more compartments, you have this more variability. When you have more compartments, you have um, I mean, if you were thinking in terms of energy, you know, you have higher energy levels. I think that's how it uh like e, e, you know, because e, for each higher energy level, you're using a, a Hermite polynomial of higher degree, right? So, but okay. energy level is what you have to show that this is really the case, because up to now this is mathematics and there's no normalization. So, what does energy mean compared to the polynomial? I mean, what is the energy there? It's well, if if I calculate uh, E sub n. Um, it will be with regard to the Hermite polynomial, let's say h e sub n of x times the e to the negative one half kx squared, like integrated over, I guess, the relevant domain or, but, but intuitively for me, like what that means is that the more variability you have, the higher the energy you're talking about, you know, like if you, you know, on a lower energy level, there'd be less variability. Well, in, in a sense, the normalization uh, or normalization here is given by what you call the space time wrapper you, you have this you have this convergence factor e to the minus mm -hmm. x squared over two that um that is making making all this normalizable um so what what i'm trying to say is like like the the way i'm kind of approaching you know thinking like combinatorial like you know what's when you have this scale you know hierarchy of energy levels right e sub you know, ground state e sub zero, e sub one. So it doesn't have to be energy levels, but based any kind of any kind of like hierarchy like that. Uh, you're going to have these uh, orthogonal polynomials of various degrees, and when you look at what those orthogonal polynomials are, like you have all this extra information, and it's saying that well, there's a leading degree which characterizes the polynomial. Well, that leading degree happens to be when every single uh, compartment is different. You know, every single element is in a different compartment. And that's also the case where you have the highest variability. And then you have lower terms. And those lower terms are, um, how can I say, um, uh, fewer compartments. So you have more room. And so you're coding up different possibilities. And so they're not explaining the um, 
the the height of the energy, but they're kind of explaining like all the information that kind of go along with that. And those coefficients are basically expanding out on the original, um, uh, you know, on the previous uh, polynomials. So like I'll be able to show a definition of Sheffer polynomials, but basically that, that definition kind of says that as you build these polynomials, they, um, they, ex they expand out um, with their information. So, so I guess that's, that's what I have uh, very interesting hopes in. It's like, what could that come to mean? And maybe it, another thing I wanted to add was about the free space. You see, if you take this interpretation where there's a distinguished compartment, it sets us up to say, well, it can have a physical meaning where there is some kind of compartment out there that's um, profoundly um, you know, different. Well, that would be the compartment with, that relates to the constant polynomial, to the first polynomial. And to say, well, that in a certain sense, that does seem to match to free space, you know, like that where there is um, where you never cross that line. Let's say you're, you know, you're, you're. But this is what you usually would call ground state. Okay, or or ground state. But so the ground state would be related to, maybe so maybe free space. So do you think that term is not helpful, or is that? Uh... Uh, no, I think it is helpful for your discussion and your uh, part. But I mean, for me. Mm -hmm. it doesn't explain more i mean when you have your explanation for the different cases yes it might make mm -hmm. sense it does make sense it helps to write down and distinguish that you have nothing happening or something happening but all the logic that a constant is different from another function is not what i can follow well, I guess for me, like there's this intuition, like why mm -hmm. would a zeroth distinguished compartment be different than other compartments? Or like, what's the role of a compartment? And I think of a compartment as boxing things in, like constraining mm -hmm. things. And I'm thinking that the distinguished compartment is somehow different in the sense that it's not constraining things. It's not, uh, you know, so there's one compartment that's not constraining things. There's other compartments that do. Is it? Is that the case? I don't know. I mean, this is what I cannot follow. Because in some sense, when we talk about these pieces, even the ground state is constrained, is boxed in. Happens at the bound state. Otherwise, it's not a bound state. Hmm. Well, cons uh, constrained in the sense that... Um, well, maybe, maybe take a little different route to it. Like, see... I'm using or abusing this notion of space uh, to say, I call it combinatorial space in the name of the mm -hmm. video, to distinguish it maybe from physical space. So physical space, we have these dimensions, you know, in the continuum, we have points, et cetera. I'm trying to say, like, I think there's something more basic than that, which we can uh, discover in this, um, in these polynomials, let's say. And the more basic thing is, um, a discrete combinatorial space unfolding, right? How does it unfold? So these partitions of sets have that kind of nature, like, well, it's not a discrete space at all, but it is like a combinatorial space. Mm -hmm. And so what's the relationship between the combinatorial space and the physical space we know and love? Well, once we add the additional constraint of orthogonality, and once we start having space-time wrappers, which relate to the probability distributions that we integrate against, we have these norms. Mm -hmm. And once we um, use uh, the polynomials, interpret the polynomials as in this graph, well, these are carving up physical space in some sense. You know, some physical dimension is being carved up here. And the idea is that those uh, discrete compartments, you know, which carry so many elements, are going to compare to these physical compartments. So the meaning would be like, let's say, one and seven are in one box. Well, that box will be some region. And let's say you have the quartic. So let's say we have the fourth Hermite polynomial. It's got four zones. So the information that one and seven correspond to will be in one of those zones of this uh, of this thing. That's kind of like, maybe that's a childish way to think. Maybe that's incorrect. But the idea is that you're, you'll have life. a way to go from discrete space to physical space. Yeah, and to me, you know, you've talked about discrete space 
to me before, but what it, what it seems to me uh, mathematically is you're taking an infinite dimensional space and you're building up one dimension, you know, like one or, or a finite number of dimensions at a time. Um, I mean, that's what these polynomials are, right? These or these uh, her, her, Hermit functions are are just well. So, they're, so maybe they're, 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 they're a basis for the functions that live on space. So, in a sense, you're looking at the functions that live on 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 space on in, infinite infinite space, and you're you're building those up one dimension at a time. It's not like you're building up the underlying space, but you. But what is the distinction between the functions that live on a space and the underlying space? And, uh, you know, some mathematicians don't make any distinction between, like a differential geometer probably doesn't make any distinction. So uh, I'll try to um, just, uh, I'll try to give an example of what I'm thinking, make sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe the way I imagine physicists usually think about uh, these types of functions in physical space, you know, they're thinking of it in physical space. They're thinking um, that if you have an integral and maybe you take it from one, uh, one point to another point, you know, you're dealing with some zone within that interval, et cetera, maybe. And then that's, um, Although maybe it'd go from negative infinity to positive infinity. But let's say, you know, in principle, you could, if you knew you could take a particular cut of area in zone. So I'm trying to say that uh, really that uh, loses a whole amount of uh, knowledge about what's actually going on that's being uh, coded in these uh, Hermite polynomials. So to gain all that knowledge, you have to, first of all, get the combinatorial objects that are being coded in the coefficients. But how will that work? Well, and there will be two aspects. Uh, because they're Scheffer polynomials, they'll have this space building act. They're building up this combinatorial space, you know, that uh, starts out with one com zero, you know, one compartment, then two compartments, three compartments, and it grows up higher as you get bigger and bigger combinatorials. But furthermore, each polynomial has a set of um, terms. And those terms uh, say that, well, one term is that every element will be in its own box or part or compartment, as I call it. But there will be many other terms where you don't have so many compartments. Uh, and then there will be one term where you basically you have no compartment. It's just what I call free space or you have the, you know, they're all in the same compartment. So um, the point is, is that if I have a, if I have a Hermite polynomial of degree 10, um, it, among its many terms, there may be a compartment, um, there may be a term which has, let's say, power x to the four. And so x to the four will mean that there are four boxes plus the free space, so to speak. And so there'll be, um, I guess, five zones. And uh, so there'll be five zones involved um, when that part is being integrated against the space-time wrapper. And in those five zones, uh, Perhaps like when you have the seven and the one, let's say being in one of those, uh, let's say five compartments, well, then that will be related to uh, one of the five places where that curve cuts the X axis, let's say, you know, the, 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 you know, cuts it into five pieces. So there may be a mapping between the compartments and the pieces uh, that the particular portion of the Hermite polynomial is uh, cutting up. So, th and the, but it just says that there's all this extra information that'll be in there, like who is connected to what and linked to what and how these information uh, that potentially someday may be usable or somehow, or at least maybe uh, may be meaningful in some model. But do you understand what I'm talking about at least? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm... I mean, I, I, my yeah. take on these polynomials are, I have a differential equation. I know the solution. I can classify them. They give me ways of showing how the eigenfunctions of this operator would look like. Mm -hmm. Basically, they give me a handle to look at an overlap between different solutions, maybe, that there can something happening or not. But they are a tool. They are not really... Right. Telling me really more. And, and so just the, the mathematically, big... because they have this 
higher degrees, they have that many zeros. That's it. It's that just comes out of mathematics and not of a physical intuition or a physical understanding out of it. It's, and so that's, I mean, the the, the that's maybe what the cool thing about math for wisdom, you know, that there are people who participate in math for wisdom, um, you know, at least support me like you do, uh, in that um, we're able to try to bridge these worlds. So what you said is basically this, the world of the physicist, um, where, yes. you know, these math things are just tools and that the physicist yes. kind of like uh, came up with these tools, so to speak. That's the tools that the physicists, you know, that are the originators of these tools. Whereas as a combinatorialist and kind of like as a philosopher i'm mm -hmm. thinking that's that's not um <laughs> i just think differently there's like more nature... there's more in the box than the physicist sees yes yeah, I think, like yes, well maybe, I, mean, yes. I think i think that... i think so i think that's what andres is saying there's more there there's we can we can peel back some layers here and get get yes. some not only not only physical intuition but also maybe some tools for mm -hmm. doing computations in a different way like yeah. uh and this may this may actually be a uh this may actually be an advance in in some way uh, maybe uh, maybe allowing for a, a different um like i'm i'm hoping that there might be some uh it might affect some advances in renormalization like it might allow mm -hmm. for Maybe a maybe a more intelligible way of doing some kinds of renormalization. I don't really know because I've never done a renormalization. But uh, you know, I'm hoping that by peeling back these layers, that there's some the that there there's at least some kind of techniques that come out of it that that maybe shed light on. on that would be great. I mean, you know, I'm, be one, be, for it. I'm but, hoping for it. I want to support you, but I don't see it myself. It's so I think that Andrews, you need we need that extra video of you with the <laughs> with the, the forward steps in time and the backward steps in time, and the way you're thinking about this, uh, so that we could critique that and maybe and maybe uh, and maybe help you sharpen that. But uh, I would say that you know, from my point of view, from purely mathematical point of view, these these. Um, what you're really doing is you're taking an infinite dimensional space and you're you're reducing it to finite dimensional parts uh, that are, that oh, it's I built understand. up from. So don't jump to three. Don't jump to you're you're really talking about functions that live on the space, not the space itself. And don't jump to the space itself so quickly because you know some of these some of these compartments may not have direct spatial representation it's only by combinations of them that you can get spatial localization that's what happens with eigenfunctions eigenfunctions to get it to get a sharply peaked um to get a sharply peaked wave function out of it you have to combine several eigenfunctions to get to get an idea to get a concept of localization eigenfunctions themselves are not localized in general and mm -hmm. so that that jump from functions to space is some kind of localization process that occurs and it occurs in a very subtle way going from functions that live on the space to an associate with the points on the space i'm saying is is more subtle than just looking at where those functions cross <laughs> you know maybe cross a horizontal line or cross uh cross some you know it it's a it's it's a uh so that's why I'm hoping that that when you put all this together and, and you make it intelligible for us, maybe that that emergent property of localization uh, becomes is it, it, sort of unpacked. It's not. Uh, I I need it unpacked a little uh, a little more now, and I think you need to create that video where you share your your intuitions about forward and backward um, steps. I'll show a, I'll show a picture. Don't be too shocked. But the, okay. see, this is. Do you see this picture uh, by Manet? I think uh, it's a famous uh, painting from the 19th century. I find but nothing really, shocking about it. Nothing is beautiful. But um, well, <laughs> I think what's totally shocking normal. is that like that's totally why normal are, behavior. <laughs> why, why are the men wearing clothes? You see, that's what's shocking about. It. I don't know this distinction. You know that the women are bathing, the men are wearing clothes, and it's this relation of physicists to nature. You see, like the physicists are kind of like talking about nature, 
but they're not trying to listen to nature. And so that's what I'm trying to say, like as a mathematician, as an algebraic combinatorian, it's like nature has something to say. So like nature is saying, look, I use Hermite polynomials. I use Laguerre polynomials. I use orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials, right? Those polynomials encode something. <laughs> listen to what I'm trying to tell you, yes. you see? And so the point is that if nature's talking to us, we should be listening. We should try to be making sense of it, you see? So that is like the voice of nature. And to turn around and say, oh, that's not nature. That is us and our tools, you see? So first of all, I yeah. think it's, that's just kind of blasphemous. So, I think so uh, it's just great. So disturbing I, agree that, me. I agree that we might not be, it, 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 it's like in mathematics, if you look at the folded up space, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, it, it, it can be very mysterious, but if you look at the covering space with various relationships or, or, um, you know, right. fold it, tap in, in a covering space, it can really, well, it, it can advance understanding um, significantly. <laughs> and and so I think that, that you know, I applaud you for doing this. It's just that we need to see the physical connection. I know. <laughs> we'll have to and, show and so you've only, I'm you've still, only and I'm still working story. on it. So, and you know, yeah. this is a, but um, maybe in preview of that, or just to say um, uh, the issues about this is that when I say combinatorial space, I think one of the things that's happening is that I'm trying to say that there's the, it's this finite building process or finite unfolding process. So it's basically saying like, it's not an infinite space. You see, there's no reason for it to be infinite. It just seems like it's probably very large, right? But there's this kind of like unfolding of, a, you know, it's as big as it needs to be would probably be better. It's as big as it needs to be, but it's not infinite. Uh, I mean, there's no reason to think it's infinite. Well, just that small distinction right there is very helpful in terms of renormalization because it's saying that uh, you don't have all these, you know, there's a highest level. It doesn't go further than it needs to, and it doesn't go further. So when you have these problems that like, well, when you're integrating out over, you know, to infinity and then you just- Before you things, said it, it be as big as it needs to be. That means you're not imposing a highest state. You're not imposing a highest state, but you're not saying that there's infinitely many. I it's agree pretty, to that, and that I think is the good physical intuition that infinity is actually just a simplification that allows to use some type of mathematics right. Right. to yes. get results in a very simple way instead of having tremendously large numbers which nobody can really understand what it should mean. Well, and so what happens? You know, well, I don't yeah, know. And often limits, <laughs> often limits are more are, are more are simpler than the than the sequences they're built from. You know, so yes. And so, I mean, this is, uh, but so, the, and so the, I, limits I the problem, the problem in renormalization is that, um, the, the way I see it from a, a layman's point of view is that, right. that some of these limits don't exist. They're, they're, they're mathematically, well, well they, and, I mean, they, they're and, infinite, and we have to so they can't be normalized, you know I mean? So like they're infinite because you yeah. used infinitely mean terms, you know, basically like each addition may have been small enough, but the point is, is that, you know, you, you can't get away with adding infinitely many things and get something non-infinite in these particular cases, let's say. Well, it, you know, my my hope is that by unfolding the combinatorics the way you've done, that maybe it it gives us a handle on which of those, like maybe we're looking at, at, at things that are collapsed and, 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 and conflated, and then by unconflating them, maybe it'll give us clear uh, picture of where to go in terms of finite limits, you know, in other words, which... I don't, does that make well, any well, sense to you, like, Thomas? I mean, you you do this. I don't do it. I, I'm just, you know, it could be that it could be that we are conflating things that shouldn't be conflated, like these terms, you know, have different. Well, so, there, so there's two, you know. So if we live in a finite universe, it's like ten to the hundredth or whatever. But this is kind of explaining, like, you know, what what it would be to live in a universe with ten to the one hundredth elements and however many partitions, you know, whatever. But it's saying that first of all, you're never going to get in a situation where you're integrating over an uh, infinite number of terms because it just never comes up because you just don't have, you know, that's not what space, that's not what the underlying combinatorial space looks like, number one. So I agree, but still it's easier to integrate than to go to these large sums. Okay, fine. But but at least it's saying in principle, like if you run into problems with your integrals, you know why, because that's yes, not, it's course. not according to, right. And, and you can't but, renormalize because it's, but, you but, get, the, but okay, so, but it could be that you're going over finite sums, but some of those terms still are like, you know, 10 to the 300th 
larger than other terms. You know, it, it could be that there's incremental sure. terms. And, and I want to infl I want to inf I want to flip it around, which is also important. So the flip side of all this is to say, what maybe I was trying to say is that you don't need a model of the continuum to do physical space physics. You just need sections. Like you need to be able to carve it up into a thousand sections or a hundred thousand sections or 10 to the ninth sections, right? But you don't need to have point. Uh, so what this or is saying- many as you want, yes. Yeah, see, so what this is saying is that if you want 10 to the ninth compartments, you will need the Hermite polynomials up to the 10 to the ninth, you know, because it'll cross the axis 10 to the ninth times. Now that's maybe simplistic and maybe that's the baby way to look at it, but that's the general idea is that the more you can box, the more boxes you have, the more you can box things in. So- But 10 to the ninth will be much too small. Sure, but I keep going. I mean, you know, but now then the model that I think that happens is that, okay, this is just one constraint. This is saying what the underlying physical world looks like from a discrete combinatorial point of view. How we engage is that we engage it through a particular space-time wrapper. And I think that there's five slash six of them, you know, that correspond to the Sheffer orthogonal polynomials. They also correspond to the... Um, natural exponential families with quadrants variance functions. So basically the possible types of uh, probability distributions that uh, orthogonal polynomials could be orthogonal with regard to. And so we, when we do a measurement, then we do it through some kind of orthogonal basis. Uh, and so then that has to happen through some space-time wrapper. And that'll be depending on the zone in the interaction process where you are. There's five zones uh, uh, before the interaction, as the thing arises, as you're inside the interaction, as it collapses, as it's entangled and afterwards. So those are the five zones. You have a different polynomial for each one. And then the idea is that, um, um, so, okay, so basically like that's, oh, so the orthogonality constraint will give you the combinatorial objects that let you engage that. Also, uh, you'll be able to, you know, oh, so you're only going to be, when you work with the orthogonal system, you're only going to be dealing with a slice of reality, whatever's involved in your measurement. So it might be, you know, 10 points from the universe or, you know, 100 points from the universe, but you're only dealing with a slice that you're able to control. It could be 10,000, you know, whatever. And so then uh, you have reduced your problem to that. Now you may do simpler models of whatever that could still may be rather complicated, but basically you've, you're only dealing with a very small slice of the universe. Um, furthermore, you are, um, um, oh yeah, you're dealing with a slice and then <laughs> it's drifted. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, my mind drifted, I can't. I was going to say. <laughs> That's not like you, Anders. It is like me when I try to not show it. It's my insight. I was hopping from rock to rock and I lost it. Um, we're talking about we're, we're talking about a finite uh, a sort of a finite model for the universe yeah there's the, okay there's a, there's a real reality of the universe which is 10 to the hundredth or 10 to the thousandth or whatever it is and then we're dealing with a little kind of piece of it that we're looking at it as observers uh, and we're engaging with that uh, through these orthogonal polynomials and uh then that's where um things like the three-dimensionality of space maybe comes up is that um because the orthogonal polynomials are based on this quadratic relation where like you have two inputs and one output, let's say, you know, you have a, a second order recurrence relation. So basically three different things are related, you know, among those dimensions. So I think that's a reason why we have like a three dimensional space is that really three dimensions says, that, you know, that says it all. That's really all you're able, you know, that's how things are connected or linked. Or like I was trying to, I think also this thing I was making, uh, that's trying to explain to Thomas, <laughs> But how like the dimensions are chained together, they're linked together, and really you only need to like have three purple things here. You only have three things at a time that are relevant anyway, so that are linking mm -hmm. up. So that's why space would be three dimensional. That so that would be a an, the three dimensionality of space, for example, would be from the observer's point of view how you're, uh, or like the way that we carve up space uh, because uh, we allow for things not to happen. That's an observer type of uh, 
situation, like in, in the underlying thing. There's no reason for things not to happen. So, but we allow for things to not happen because we're measuring that. So we carve up space as we choose to. And so maybe to carve up space, you need something to carve it with. And so the carving knives are these Hermite polynomials. I lost Again, I, 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 you know, I would caution you against a literal carving up a space. You know, you're carving up the functions that live on space in, 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 in finite dimensional chunks. And, uh, and well, well, so we'll see because so, and then there's some localization that comes in there, like like it. It's almost like space is an immature, and 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 primitive and paleolithic way of looking at what's really happening in nature, and and what's really you know the the more the more elevated way of thinking of it is these functions that live on space that that really give us our our well that are have have actually a or or the real deal that's what we well, see so i'm trying to maybe push that push, push back against i may be wrong you may be right but and you know because you're more mature mathematically in certain in these types of ways you study functional analysis but i'm pushing back in the sense that like what's happening here is that the hermite polynomials in some sense at least with regard to the coefficients you see like so it's saying that the variable in the hermite polynomial isn't really relevant for anything it's just relevant for us as a way to imagine physical space. The information yeah. about the Hermite yes. is just in the coefficients. Yes. Those coefficients are That's from- That's what I'm the, saying. That's what I'm saying, Anders. Well, I'm but, saying the, but, the but those coefficients are given by um, counting, or but we could say not counting. We could say listing or generating the possibilities, which are finite in the set of partition space. But then we interpret the Hermite polynomial as a function. And so we squeeze all that information actually into a single dimension. You know, and so you get these spaces. And so these Hermite polynomials become a basis for, uh, well, for linear functionals that are, but in a certain sense, they're all mapping that into a single dimension. And then when you look from the side, it looks like, oh, there's this infinite dimensional space where you have all these maybe functionals, you know, but the, you know, where you have these Hermites that are the basis for this infinitional dimensional space and functional space. But see, I'm saying that all comes later. That doesn't really, that's when the observer is involved. So, I mean, in, in my fantasy world here, I'm thinking that by your unpacking of these terms, you know, and looking at pedigrees, almost like your covering space idea, mm -hmm. that this might have some power in terms of, of knowing, of understanding how nature is kind of mopping up um, these things that... Uh, what am I trying to say here? Because it's, you know, I have a vague, uh, vague uh, gr grasp on the physics, but that, you know, certain things are, are collapsing and you're not seeing them when you combine these terms, but you're seeing them when you, when you look at the individual pedigrees where they came from. Right. The nature is kind of, in other words, you're getting sort of telescoping sums where certain things are naturally mopping themselves up as, as lines of, uh, uh, sort of lines of possible interactions that don't actually end up happening because you're looking at a deeper, uh, you know, at, at, at a deeper level of where these terms are coming from. And you're seeing that certain things, when you add them up, actually add up to zero or add up to something finite, you know, whereas when you combine everything, it's too conflated to, to, to see that happening. So that's what I'm hoping, you know, that comes out of your, combinatorial analysis is that you're actually you're you're conflating too soon maybe uh, in in the the way we standardly the the standard treatment of physics and standard treatment of these these uh, eigenfunctions that there's oh, too much right. conflated in there where when you unpack it you can see that that there's just natural um destructive interference going on that you can throw out so maybe that would give you a way of of, and and, of, and of I doing, remember of, of doing of doing renormalization in a in a in maybe a maybe easier to understand way. I don't know. Okay, so, so I remember what I forgot. And so like the one of the you know I'll be making these videos about the combinatorics on the Schrodinger equation solution level, which is what we've been talking about. But the yeah. crucial thing for physics is the quantum field theory level. And so the crucial thing there will be um, to hop from the use 
well, to hop on to Feynman diagrams. So the very promising thing that gives me hope, you know, which uh, is that uh, when you look at Wick's theorem and you look at how it rearranges pairs of, you know, links pairs of terms, of, and I see that it's the very same combinatorics that used by the Hermite polynomials, right? So then the idea is that, well, if I understood all these polynomials, you know, very well, the combinatorics, then I could lift that up to the other polynomials and say, hey, like, this is different ways of building Feynman diagrams. And those Feynman diagrams, the difference would be that uh, instead of just looking at the interaction points and what happens at the interaction points, there would be uh, the legs in the Feynman diagram would have a kinematic interpretation. And the kinematic interpretation would be working in both directions and it would be these particle clocks. These certain statistics saying that, well, you're generating objects as you, you know, with steps alpha going one way and steps beta going the other way in all possible ways, blah, 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 you get different statistics. So uh, see, once I do that, if I could do that, uh, if nature does that, then um, hopefully it gives you five different ways of calculating things instead of the one that we have right now. And then hopefully it just says, look, you don't need to think in terms of physical points. It's the Feynman diagram. So I'm on the side of the people who would say it's the Feynman diagrams that are real Whereas the quantum uh, whole field theory imagination that, you know, at every point, you know, you have these multiple integrals is going, you know, you integrate over your single point, you know, in the continuum in all directions. I don't think that, but that's probably not the common view, but. So in other words, you want a combinatorial, uh, a purely combinatorial way of approaching physics. And cutting out the whole physical thing. Cutting until out the middle, there's an, cutting out until the middle there's man an observer of space. And a measurement, yeah. right? That it, so, I mean, this. So, um, and anyway, that's what that's why I was so intrigued by your comments toward the end of the video about this idea of a covering, you know, like a a covering theory for combinatorics. You know that you know you've already on you've already shown that there's this unpacking that can happen with the in, with the terms. Um, and, and it's curious that like with root systems, like the, the, the possibilities are so limited, you know, in terms of what could be happening. Right. Right. So once you have this covering space idea, you know, one of the things is like it may super limit down like what is possible, uh, you know, make so it that, very. So at least to another one of my questions is that, you know, you made this bijection between the pedigrees of the terms of the Shefford polynomials and the partitions of a set. Mm -hmm. The thing is the partitions of a set are very combinatorial intrinsic, right? That's a, almost one of the most basic combinatorial right. options, the partitions right. of a set. Very encouraging, yeah. Right, so does that mean that Shefford polynomials are the only generating functions that have uh, pedigrees that are one-to-one -one corresponds with partitions of a set. Or is there a more general set of polynomials? It is, is, in other words, does that does that sort of characterize the, is it another way of characterizing the Shepard polynomials? Their generating functions are in one-to-one -one correspondence, or at least the pedigrees that they're generating. Um, well, I think, so okay, the so- terms are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the partitions of a set. Is Are they the only, are they the only polynomials with this with this property? The only polynomial sequences with this property, or is there a larger class of polynomial sequences with that, that property? So it's it's really just a a question about Shepard polynomials. Um, yeah. So I was going to give um, I was going to give um, just uh, also um, kind of related like to give other ways of characterizing the Shepard polynomials, but. The point of this characterization is that there's really not much to it, you know, so depending on like, like okay. this A of T is really just a constant in front, so to speak, you know, it's a function in front. And then E to the X U of T, it's just saying that the exponential is, um, is so basic to this, right? Like the, the exponential is what's able to assemble things, so to speak. And especially yeah. if you use, which I kind of talk a little about in the video, you know, if you use this idea of the multinomial, right? So you're using these multinomials, you get this multinomial, you know, you get this choice, uh, you know, which is related to choosing from all these compartments. So anything you do is gonna basically have that exponent here. And that's really all this here. All this X is doing is giving a weight to count the number of compartments, 
right? So e to the u of t is super simple. X comes for free if you just count the compartments. What, would, what you would do in combinatorics is that, you know, you could make this much more fancy and elaborate. So you could put all kinds of other, uh, you could make u of t much more exotic and you could have it count all kinds of things, et cetera, et cetera, right? You could put, uh, you could try to put other um, weights on here, counting different things. But I think in terms of the basic form, the answer should be that uh, unless you had some entirely different interpretation of mathematics, you know, like this is the interpretation where like multiplication means and, you know, plus means or. So if you recoded everything differently, well, then maybe, you know, but I think in terms of, you know, if, if you're if you're saying that plus means and, and uh, I mean, plus means or and multiplication means and, then I think you would get something of this form if you tried to do. Uh, so that's the answer. Maybe I will show. Um, but I will have to go soon. I mean, yes. Indre was already telling children go, should go to bed. She has to work. Yes. And yes. So, Any other comments, Thomas? I mean, I think it was interesting. You answered some of my questions, but you didn't convince me of the point yeah. yet that your viewpoint is better. I still like the zero as being part of the numbers. It doesn't, but I think that your viewpoint has its values and you shouldn't drop it because of my preference for including zero into the numbers. It's well, so because you're so influential in my life and just as a powerful thinker, then, you know, as a person okay. with great intuition and a great teacher. So there's always a risk that you may sway me. So, but I respect your uh, support no. of my yeah. investigation. I mean, I think it, your viewpoint has important parts, which the symmetry part doesn't have. Yes. I have to accept What parts, what parts did you that. like of the viewpoint? I mean, in which sense did you like? I mean, the, the one that the free space is something special and you can re regain it, yes. Of course, you can formulate it again symmetrically, right. but mm. yeah. Mm. Okay. But yeah. I have and, to see and now good a, night. And, and, okay, saying good night. Space, and saying it's free space is, is a bit loaded. You have to tell us, it's you know, like, in a later space. video, you have to tell us why you think that's, that's, um, you know, related to the free space wrapper, as you call it, and and time and, space wrapper, yeah, yeah, time space, yeah. Space time wrapper, yeah. So, so, and then, um, okay, so I, I admit that I, you know, I, I, I was not able to support my position in a most convincing way yet, but I'm working. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still time to come. But yes. I should bring the kids to bed because yes. it's late. It's okay. 10 o'clock for us and they should, well, be asleep like one hour ago. And yeah, I mean, somebody's missing to put them to bed. So okay. and it's, it's so noon. It's, it's time. To listen. And it's time for lunch in San Diego. So I should go too. Uh, okay. okay so I want to thank you. Thank all our listeners for right. um, Math for Wisdom. So like this video, leave comments, uh, share and uh, support me through Patreon. See you in future discussions. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so signing off. Okay. Goodbye.